Hey, Victory Family Church, King Builders. My name is Doug Smith, and I am the development director here at Light of Life. And this year, we're celebrating our 70th year of ministering to the homeless men, women, and children of our city right here on Pittsburgh's north side. And the way that we minister is twofold. One is we are a faith-based organization. We believe that Christ is the answer in everything that we do. And two is our continuum of care. So no matter where someone is in their homelessness journey, we want to have a next step for them. And that starts with our street outreach team that goes out to the street homeless on a daily basis just to build relationships with them in hopes that they'll come in for some of our services. To our meal ministry, where we provide hundreds of thousands of meals to our community and those in need each and every year. To our emergency shelter, this year we'll actually have over 3,000 unique individual guests in our shelters. And all the way to our long-term programming. The, the building behind me is actually the future facility for our long-term programming, which we're calling Bridge Place. And up to 80 men and women, plus their children, can be in our long-term programs. And when they're in our long-term programs, we help them with their recovery, we help them get an education and employment, and we help them find housing before they graduate. And so that's kind of an 80,000 foot view of the ministry that we offer. Thank you so much for being a kingdom builder. Thank you for caring about the homeless men, women, and children of our city. It matters and it makes a difference. Thank you so much. a mission to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally. And we want to share the good news of Jesus every chance we get. I used to be lost spiritually, but Jesus rescued me and changed my life. And now I want to give others that same opportunity. As a part of Victory Family Church, I get to leave behind a legacy and make an impact for all eternity. That's why I am a Kingdom Builder. I'm a Kingdom Builder. Together, we are Kingdom Builders. Once I realized how much God loved me, there was no way that I wouldn't do everything in my power to reach those who need Jesus. It's really important to me that when I give to Kingdom Builders, it's helping my neighbors and those who are nearby. And when I give, I know that my impact is also felt all around the world. I love that through Kingdom Builders, I get to invest in other future Christian leaders like myself, and we get to reach people in a real practical way. We are able to get our children involved with giving at such a young age. And Kingdom Builders is teaching them to be generous, faithful, and to think of others before themselves. So we invite you to join us as we spread the hope and love of Jesus to our communities. And all around the world. And whether your commitment is big or small, we believe that together with God, we can make an impact that will last for eternity. We are, we are, we are, we are Kingdom Builders. What an amazing privilege it is to be able to share God's word, God's kingdom around the world. What an honor, what an honor it is at all of our campuses, at all of the people that are a part of Victory everywhere. Thank you for the, thank you for your commitment to make an impact in the world. We want to take a moment this Kingdom Builders weekend and, and welcome our two, our two campuses, Meadville and Newcastle. We love you all so much and those with us online. Cranberry, would you welcome them? Come on. We love you guys. One church in multiple locations. Praise God. We're so glad you're here with us. As you heard earlier in the service today, we're talking about Kingdom Builders and the three aspects of it, world mission projects, expanding God's kingdom in our own nation, our own backyard even, and then raising up future Christian leaders. The focus I want to have for you today is that what our local impact, it just locally here and in our own nation, but, but, but very specifically, today is the weekend in which we do our impact offering. And I'm so glad you're here this weekend for this, whether you're a guest or whether you're a longtime person at Victory, because it's going to help you understand the heart of God for this, for literally what this church exists for. So I want to take you into a, a subject today that may sound a little, a little different, but I want to help you understand something critical about how to partner with God. Everybody say partner with God. See, we don't work for him, we partner with him. And if I were to explain to you today that if there was someone today that I said, hey, I met a guy or a lady, and she is partnering in business with Elon Musk or with uh, Jeff, is it Bezos, the Amazon guy, or Bill Gates, you immediately would lift your expectation of what you thought that person would produce with that partnership because of who they've partnered with. 
you get to partner, not just as, 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 just, uh, as an individual, but as a church. We partner together with God, together. He is our partner. We partner with him. But I want to help you to see that there are strategic things in God. Here's the title. The power of strategic o- obedience. The power of strategic obedience. And here's the first point. Strategic obedience starts as a seed. Strategic obedience starts as a seed. I'm talking to you about obeying within the kingdom of God as a child of God. That God is a strategic God. And you'll see that very clearly as we go through today. I want to read a scripture to you in in Genesis 8.22. And it will really make a lot more sense when you understand who God said it to and why. In Genesis 8.22, God said this. As long as the earth exists, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God's made a a declaration in this statement that he made to a person. And I'll tell you in a moment who it is. He said, as long as the earth exists, there will be something called seed, time, harvest. Plant a seed, time exists, then there's a harvest. Then he also said cold and heat. I wish he left that out. This weekend, it has been, this is like Indian summer on steroids. How many of you love this weekend's weather? Come on, man, isn't it incredible? I'm praying for just very unique and specific and centralized global warming to come to Pittsburgh (laughs) forever and ever. Amen. Anybody just love ongoing? Anyway, I know some of y'all love winter. I don't understand you, but you're in the right place if that's what you love. But I want to help you today to understand who was God speaking to. He was speaking to a man named Noah after the flood. Now imagine you're Noah, the waters recede, and everybody's gone, and everything's gone. Now what? God is saying this to Noah for a reason. Noah's looking on an earth that's been devastated. And he's saying to him, Noah, listen, relax. Uh, That's my interpretation. But he's saying, listen, as long as the earth exists, these things are are going to be in place. And the one I want you to, he centralized Noah on was seed, time, and harvest. Because I'm sure Noah's thought is, now what? And and what God is wanting us to see that like Noah in our culture today, people are saying the same thing that walk with God. Now what? Look at the landscape of our society. What do I do? The same thing he said to Noah is what he would say to you. And I want you to see the strategy that exists within the principle of seed, time, and harvest. Remember this about devastation. Devastation in the earth will only be impacted, only be impacted with seeds of obedience from God's people. That's the only way devastation changes. And what he's saying to Noah, what you're seeing today will not be here in the future if you will follow the principle of seed, time, and harvest. The primary strategy, the primary strategy of the kingdom of God is seed, time, and harvest. That's God's primary strategy. Now, what do I mean by that? Is that most of us see God as the God of instantaneous things. I pray, and then something happens. Everything you do in life is a seed. God created the earth to function that way. Everything, everything, everything in the earth starts with a seed. Everything. If you fall in love, it started with a seed. If you start a business, the greatest business and companies in the world that have ever existed started in a seed of someone's heart. If you're going to have a baby, it starts with... A seed. Every, God made everything in the earth to operate that way. And yet we, we understand that, we embrace that when we think of a farmer. A farmer plants, and what does the farmer do? He waits, and then he harvests. But he plants his seed with hope, the Bible said. He hopes for a heart. He expects something on the other side of the planting. Now we see that when it comes to a farmer and we, we understand that, and we would go, no, you would never go to a farmer and say, I can't believe you just wasted all that time. You planted all those seeds, and now they're gone. They're in dirt. Are you out of your mind? How much do you pay for those seeds? And, and, and he actually borrowed money to plant seeds. You would think, are you crazy? But we would never say that to a farmer because we know the outcome is a harvest. But we don't think of that in every area of our life. If anybody ever struggled in a relationship, wave at me. And for the rest of you, lying's a sin. It's okay, though. Um, If your marriage is in a tanker or a toilet, he said, how do you know the people are there? Because if you're married in a length of time, the tanker's coming your way, at least it's someday. 
And people want it to get better overnight. Everything gets better seed, time, and then the harvest. Why is that important? Because it's a kingdom strategy. Hey, this Tuesday, vote. No, listen, vote, 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 vote. Early and often. No, I'm just teasing about that. But seriously, this isn't Chicago. Vote, okay? Come on. Oh, come on. That's funny. I don't care. I don't care who you are. Come on, Chicago has a great history way back from when Nixon ran against, come on, Kennedy, it's just a fun thing to say. So I didn't think it was funny, but get a sense of humor, you'll live. It's a, but vote. And when I encourage you, people always say to me, Pastor, why don't you tell people more about who they should vote to? Because I don't think people are stupid. I think if you have a relationship with God, you should have some sense. And, and what I encourage you to do when you vote, listen, you represent Jesus. Not the Republican Party, not the Democrat Party, and not any issue of your choosing. I hear people say all the time, see what matters most to you, then vote. If you're a Christian, put that in the toilet and flush that. That's a lie. You ask God what matters to him, and you steward that vote as a representative of Christ on the earth as his body. That's what Christians do, period. And you follow God's word, and you'll be fine, but vote, vote, vote. It's critical, it's critical that you do so. Now, Here's the thing about kingdom, seed time, and harvest. It requires faith. The other things that we do in our natural realm, like when you watch a farmer do it, we see the natural process of it. But one of the reasons people don't do it in other areas of their life, even very natural areas, everything in the earth, everything in the earth operates under that principle, is we don't have faith in that principle. Now, natural seeds are corruptible. That means they can fail. Natural seeds that you plant have a fail ratio. But the Bible calls God's word, listen, an incorruptible seed. That means a seed that cannot fail. But it takes faith to plant it. Because when you plant a seed, it leaves your life. It disappears below the surface of your life. And so understand, the first part of strategic obedience is that everything you do for God and in his kingdom and in your life, is a seed. Now, 1988, the seed of this church began. The church actually didn't start until 1993, 29 years ago. But in in 1988, when Michelle and I were driving through Cranberry Township, we were driving on our way to speak at Apollo, Pennsylvania. We were traveling and speaking in churches at the time. We were driving on the other side of Cranberry on Freedom Road out of Beaver County. And as we, we were just talking in our car, Nothing, we weren't praying, we we're just driving along, and the presence of God fills the vehicle. Now I said, How do you know that? Because it happened simultaneously. We stopped talking. And immediately God dealt with both of our hearts. Let me say it this way He spoke to both of our hearts the same thing. Now I want to make sure you understand what I mean by that. I don't mean that I heard a voice or Michelle heard a voice, but it was like someone dropped a paragraph in your soul and you understood the outcome of it, you comprehended it all. And we stopped talking immediately at the same time. And about seven, eight, nine seconds later, Michelle said to me, honey, did God just say something to your heart? I said, yes. He said, what what did he tell you? I said, well, what did he tell you? (laughs) And we went back and forth. Finally, she said, he told me we're going to start a church here someday. I said, me too. I said, isn't that wild? Now, my wife, being the more spiritual one, was willing just to take that as it was and let let the seed sit in the ground, but not me. I had to make it. And men know everything. Ladies, that was a great place for you to laugh, right? Come on, man. We, we just, it, it, it's just a weakness that we have. And, and so we weren't 10 seconds away from that. I said, let me tell you what it means, honey. Bless my heart. Now, my wife's from the South. That's a nice way to say you're stupid. I said, honey, you know I'm not called to pastor. I could never pastor a church. What that means, somebody else will start a church in Cranberry, and we will know it's God's will to come help them. We'll do everything we can to serve that pastor and that vision and mission to touch this region from that town. And years, I mean, went by and no one ever started one. We kept kept watching. We were living in Africa as missionaries. And and we began to, we love Africa and we wanted to stay there. We said, Lord, we'll give our life here. But what about the cranberry thing? And here's how I prayed. Lord, I can't go help somebody that won't obey you. (laughs) I'm just being honest with you. I was in presumption and ignorance. I just said, Lord, If someone doesn't start, what can I do? And so over time, we just committed it to prayer. And both of us came to the realization that God was dealing with us to start it. And we both said the same thing to God independently. You got the wrong couple. 
Because what we thought you needed to obey God was a harvest. And all God needs is a seed of obedience. Everybody say the seed of obedience. And everything you see here today started with that seed. The multiplied tens of thousands of people over the 29 years that have come to Christ in the services started with the seed of obedience. And now the seeds of obedience of thousands and thousands of other people have been added to that. And now you see this that started as a small seed is reaching into Newcastle. It's reaching into Meadville and beyond through kingdom builders. That's how the kingdom of God works. Now remember this about generosity. The Bible calls your giving a seed. Your, the Bible calls your, your giving a seed. As we, as we move toward the impact offering at the end of today's service at all of our campuses, and for those of you online, I want you to understand the principle of the strategy of God is that all obedience is a seed. Now listen, generosity is an unseen seed that requires faith to plant. What do I mean it's unseen? Is that it has to leave your life for it to work. And if you don't understand the kingdom principle of seed, everybody say time, then harvest, you'll think something's leaving you, and it's not the case at all. Now, it makes sense when we think of a farmer, but it also makes sense if you know the scripture, because again and again in the Bible, it refers to your giving as a seed. Let me read one to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is when they were receiving an offering. In fact, this is a kingdom builder's offering for the church of Jerusalem who was under great persecution and distress. And let me show you what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth about their participation in this offering. Listen now. Remember this. A farmer, he's talking about giving. A farmer who plants only a few seeds get, will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide. Say out loud, I must decide. I must decide. Now remember, he said, here's common sense. If a farmer plants just a few seeds, does he ever wake up the next morning and expect a large harvest? No. He said, but if he plants a lot of seeds, he should expect what? A large harvest. He said, now you decide, you decide, you decide the, 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 the breadth and depth and width of your seed, and that will determine your harvest. Listen to me, not God. Not God. You decide. Listen to what he said. You must decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or, or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. And then you always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God is showing you the principle of seed, time, and harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. And he said, to the, to the measure with which you give, Jesus said it this way, is the measure that God gives back to you. Why? Because you control the portion. Now, that makes perfect sense when you think of farming. But Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said, to, and, and please understand this, this isn't amounts of money. There are some people that will be giving what would consider a very modest amount of money, but in, in proportion to their income or even their need, they're giving an incredible abundance. And then there are people that may be worth $20, $30 million that might give a quarter of a million dollars, and that was nothing but a tip. You didn't even miss it. It was, well, that was generous of me. No, it's not. See, God's not looking for tips. He is looking for partners that go all in in the kingdom. Now, that's not suggesting they have to give more than that or less than that. I'm simply saying they need to decide in their heart what do they seek to plant. And God is looking for generosity, and that's by degree based on the situation that the individual is in. Remember this about your seed when you give financially. Your seed will leave your hand, but it will never leave your life. The seed that you plant, whatever that may be, in obedience, in obedience to God, will, it, it may leave your hand or your life in the sense that it goes away from me, but it will never leave your life in the sense that it will bring a return to you. Because God is faithful. Please remember this about the God you serve. He will never stand in the debt of any human being. The God of all creation will never be indebted to me. Everything I do is by his grace and his enablement. And he says to me and he says to you, you get to choose. 
Kingdom Builders, I want you to know you are making an impact in church planters in, just in the Northeast. I'm just going to tell you about four of them very quickly. Right now, this year, that you have made significant investments financially into their work. These four couples have gone to places and have left incomes and have left jobs and careers with their family to obey God like Michelle and I did 29 years ago to come here. And they are in the Northeast, and the, one of the couple, Matt and Jess Joya, are in Bangor, Maine. Man, that's a belly of the beast of no God in that area. It's like preaching in Europe. They're in Bangor, Maine. Look at that wonderful family. They got a mess of kids, don't they? Aren't they amazing? They, now, imagine starting a church during a pandemic, leaving a job where you were making six figures to go plant a church in Bangor, Maine, and bring your family with you, and no guarantee of anything. That's a kingdom builder. And you get the privilege of helping fund them, helping serve them as a family. This is what you're doing with Kingdom Builders. In Camden, New Jersey, Ernest and Sarah Grant, these are remarkable people. They've done the same thing in Camden, New Jersey. Providence, Rhode Island. And Michelle and I had the privilege of spending time with some of these people when we were on vacation. We took 10 days and went through the New England states, went to the state capitals and prayed over those, that region. A wonderful couple in Providence, Rhode, uh, Rhode Island, Leslie and Hannah McMillan. Lastly, in Philadelphia. Now, we love Philadelphia. It's the city of bro brotherly love, except we hate the Phillies and the Eagles. It's okay, and, and the Flyers. But other than that, God loves them. For, other than that, you know, it's okay. But Mark and Monica Poland. Mark Poland and his, I mean, and his wife. I mean, these people are remarkable people. Mark in the corporate world, I mean, I'm telling you, he's a beast. And he said goodbye to it to obey the call of God. Kingdom Builders, that's what you're doing with your income. We don't raise money here. This isn't a fundraiser. This is a kingdom building. And part of kingdom building is obedience in your generosity. Second point I want you to get is this. There is a cost to strategic disobedience. The cost of strategic. Everyone say strategic. See, obedience is strategic, but I also want you to see there is another kingdom involved that will make your disobedience, strategic. The scripture says about Satan in, in, in 2 Corinthians 2, because remember this, both God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom have strategies. It says this, I don't want Satan to outwit us and gain the upper hand. After all, we are not ignorant of Satan's strategies and devices. As God his strategy is for me to obey him through the principle of honoring him with my obedience as a seed, expecting over time for a harvest to be produced. Satan expects to do the same office. He has a strategic disobedience for you that will stop the work of God's kingdom in you and through you. It's strategic. And I want you to see such a person that this happened to in the Bible very directly. The Bible refers to him or he's referred to as the rich young ruler. And in a sense, you could say in our culture, you have it all. He's rich, he's young, and he has power. And I want you to see his interaction with Jesus and the response of those who already said yes and gave their life as a seed. Let me show it to you. In Mark chapter 10, in verse 17, it says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, I want you to listen to the next sentence. Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's really important. He's not speaking to someone he's about to rebuke. He's not giving him a task to do that's some religious stupidity. He looked at him and he loved him. The next words he sang are based on his love for this young man. One thing you lack, he said, if you want to be perfect, because that's what he was trying to be to get to heaven, and no one can earn heaven. If you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then come, then come, then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Jesus looked around at his disciples and he said, how hard is it for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, the disciples were amazed and they said to to one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, let let me help you understand something. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, follow me. I love you. Follow me. And he said, go take what you have in your wealth. Give it to the poor. Then, everybody say then. After you put that second, then come and follow me. And the Bible said that he had great wealth, so he said no. And Jesus said, do you see how difficult it is for a person with wealth to follow me because their money came before me? The eye of the needle is not what many of you may think it is. The eye of the needle is not that, you know, putting a thread through the eye of the needle. The eye of the needle was a gate in the city. It was a pedestrian gate. The ci- every city that was walled had a, a main commerce gate that was open during daylight hours. And that's when people of commerce would come in and out. A wealthy person, imagine if someone had great wealth today, they may have three or four semis when they move. Imagine you have 70, 80, 90 camels. And to get into the city with your wealth, you just simply go right through the main gate. But when that gate's closed and the pedestrian gate called the eye of the needle is open after hours, so to speak, the sun's down. He said, now what you have to do is you have to strip every camel of all of its possessions. You have to get that camel somehow to be willing to go on its knees and walk it on its knees through, the, through that small door. And then get them all to stand up and then carry all your possessions through that little door. Put them back on the camel and then go into your city. That's a really hard thing to do. And yet what Jesus was simply saying is simply this. Until you understand that I'm first, and no matter, it isn't just money, a lot of things can be for God in my life. He was trying to say to to his disciples, I gave him an offer and he rejected it because he put his wealth above me. Now listen what happened next. This is so important. Verse 27, or verse 28. Peter said this to Jesus. Now we have left everything to follow you. And I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one has left home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for me and the gospel who will fail to receive 100 times as much in this present age or life. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children's fields, and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, The most important thing, eternal life. But many today who are first will be last and the last first. Now, I want you to see an incredible parallel. Jesus said two words that he rarely said to anybody, to this young man. He looked upon this young man and he said, follow me. It's exactly what he said to the 12 apostles. Follow me. And they immediately left everything. Peter said, wait a minute. You just invited him to follow you like we did into your intimate circle. And he said, no, but we didn't. He said, what about us? He said, when you told me to follow you, I left everything. I left my fishing business. I left my family business. And I left, I mean, I left my nets on the shore. And I started following you. What about me? And when Jesus said to him, don't you think for a minute that God is going to be in your debt? No one, listen to me, kingdom builder. No one, no one, no one. No one has ever left anything for Christ and his kingdom and the gospel that God will not repay back to you more than you've ever thought to be able to give to him. God will never be in the debt of a human being. And he said, and the outcome of that obedience will not just be God passing wealth, if you will, resources and talent through you. He said, but eternal life will come out of your life, not just for you, but the people he's called you to touch. And he said, many that are trapped in this world and their insight and their lack of understanding of the strategy of seed, time, and harvest will be trapped in this world. And they think they're first, but they will be last. But those who walk in the kingdom, they look last, but I'm telling you, they'll be first. How many of you think he told the truth? He told the truth. And it matters. This is how he will build my life and your life. Remember this, Satan's kingdom It's a simple strategy with your resources and not just your money, but your time, your talent and everything around you is to make you a reservoir 
to make all that you are, all that you have, all that you own, all that, God bless my four and no more. Help me, Lord, help me put it in the can and hide the can. Help my 401k not to be a 201k. Whoops. What's he saying? There's a strategy that will destroy my life. And it's when I become a reservoir with my life. The kingdom principle is a river. That means there is an inflow and an outflow. But here's the awesome thing of walking with God. The inflow doesn't come from you. It comes from him. And the more you walk in the principle, the more of heaven's resource, heaven's power, heaven's abilities pass through your life. And that's how a kingdom builder lives. But there is a price to pay to strategic disobedience. And I have to ask myself, and I do often like you have to, what strategy is governing the way I live? Here's the last and third. Strategic obedience brings kingdom multiplication. Let me say it again. Strategic obedience brings kingdom multiplication. Sometimes we think of God like he's not strategic. Now, we know Satan is. You saw that in the scripture. But almost like he's so distant from you that he has no strategy for your life. Where do you think we got the the desire to be strategic? We didn't get that from ourselves. It comes from God. I want you to see the strategic nature of God when it comes to building the kingdom. Virtually every ministry that we support through Kingdom Builder, I'm telling you, it is, there's been a tapestry woven of God that has connected us to those ministries. It is an happenstance. God is intentional about what you give your life for. God is intentional about what you give your resources for. Let me show you such a place in Scripture where the church planting in the Apostle Paul's life was so strategic by God and required obedience. This is in Paul's second missionary journey. He took three. Now let me take you into his second missionary journey. Acts 16, verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because, listen now, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at the time. They attempted to go into the province of Asia and the Holy Spirit prompted them and said, no, don't go there right now. God's strategic. Verse 7. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. Twice, God said, not yet. I have another place for you. See, we sometimes just think people show up in just happenstance. God is strategic, not just with the apostle Paul or some pastor or preacher. He is strategic with your life, in your vocational life. It is in happenstance. He has a specific specific strategy for your life to be a kingdom builder in the sphere of influence that you have. And as important as it was for Paul to learn to hear his voice, it is equally important that I and that you learn to hear his voice as well. Listen to what he went on to say. Verse 8, so instead they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. Now they're at the, they're at the very border's edge of the Aegean Sea and they ain't nowhere else to go except back. Now what, God. Here we find ourselves in Troas. We tried to go there. You said no. We tried to go there. You said no. And now he doesn't know what to do. Have you ever been in the place in your life where you don't know what's next? You're not alone. But remember this strategic obedience, not just happenstance, not just tipping God. Pray about what God would have you to give in your life to him with your time and your talent and your resources. Pray. Let your heart compel you and do what he leads you to do. So, so very important. So that night, verse 9, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided, everyone say we decided. Notice this is a group thing, not just one person. We decided to leave for Macedonia when? At once. Say it out loud at all the campuses. At once. Not when we got all of our ducks in a row. Obedience doesn't wait for ducks to be in a row. Shoot your ducks and eat them. I don't eat meat. Make a tofu duck. Shoot it and eat it. When I get all my life in order, God, then, that's not how, that's not how the kingdom works. You plant seeds, no matter what it looks like and feels like. Please get that. Please get that. At once, having concluded, God was calling us to preach the good news there. Now, This one step of of strategic obedience had an amazing impact. 
This is the first time the gospel would ever be preached on the continent of Europe. First time. Never before. And this is where a lot of churches were planted that you know about, that you have books in the Bible from. The church of Philippi was the first, and then the church of Thessalonica, then Corinth and Ephesus. All of those churches were planted by this one act of strategic obedience. Everybody say out loud, strategic obedience. What is on the other side of your strategic obedience with your finances? For the kingdom and for you, but the kingdom first. And I also ask this of myself so often. What's on the other side of my disobedience? Because it is one or the other. There is no gray scope. There is, it's not gray scale. It's one or the other. There is an outcome to my obedience in the kingdom and to my disobedience. One of the ministries you support locally is the Urban Impact Foundation. Over 25 years ago, Ed and Tammy Glover went there and brought their entire family. Now, if you know anything about the north side of Pittsburgh 25 years ago, it was blighted. It was a place, uh, that main drag there where, where Allegheny Hospital is, was a place of prostitution. There were porn places everywhere. It was brutal. And Ed and Tammy Glover, 25 years ago, were called to go bring their children there and live. And they started the Urban Impact Foundation as a seed. Everyone thought he was crazy. Their car got stolen over and over again. They, had to, they couldn't leave their kids alone because there were needles everywhere. And their kids were raised in a place that you typically wouldn't choose to bring children to. But they gave their life as a seed. 25 plus years later, the Urban Impact Foundation, listen please, on the north side of Pittsburgh, the north side of Pittsburgh is the size of Erie. They have led, multiplied, listen, tens of thousands of kids to Christ by that obedience. The Urban Impact Foundation, and not only that, they not only serve them with, they, 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 they partner with Light of Life and they feed the kids and they educate kids. And if you join, and thousands of kids have done this on the north side, if you become a part of their program to get you out through high school and that develop you spiritually. Listen, I want you to get this percentage, and this is not hyperbole. I know this to be a fact. In fact, Chick-fil-A gave them a, a, an award based on this statistic. I know nothing close to this statistic. 90 plus percent of the students that enter their program graduate high school, and then they either go to college, they go to trade school, they go to the military, or begin training for ministry. 90%, not just graduate, but they take a next step with their life. That's kingdom building. That's kingdom building. That's worth everything I can give. I got a text message this two, three days ago from Ed and Tammy, uh, specifically from Ed. He said, John, there's been so much violence on the north side. And, and he said, I haven't seen it like this in years, and I'm telling you, it's becoming very, very difficult to be here. Not for us, we're used to this, but for the people who live here. And he said, I'm telling you, he said, we're going to be taking November 9th through the 23rd for two weeks, and we're going to fast and pray together as an organization. John, would you, would you just take those two weeks? Would you fast and pray with us? He said, if, if you could, could you mention it to the church? And any of them that would have it in their heart, fast and pray with us. We are here to, we want to serve these, these precious people. And the violence that's happening right now is devastating. They've given their life as a seed. When I tell you you're a kingdom builder, that's what you're doing. This is not a fundraiser. It is life-changing. And the lives of kids that have been changed, it's absolutely remarkable. Then lastly, I want you to understand there is strategic obedience in your generosity. It isn't just throwing God a tip. I, look, we're all at different levels of understanding with God, but I'm talking to you about your heart being connected to heaven and the ability to hear his heart for people and to do the highest and the best you can. So I, for the $2.5 million goal that I'm believing God for us to break past that goal and give every penny of it away to these ministries and, and watch the videos of you and our church family calling those ministries, telling them of the amount of money that's extra being given and watching them weep as they touch the world. I'm believing that we'll blast that $2.5 million goal out of the, out of the water. So what, what do we have so far? Don't do the math. Do your part. A couple of weeks from now, we'll let you know the total. We'll let you know your kingdom builders impact offering total. And then we're going to trust God by year's end that every penny of it plus will come in. But it's strategic. And I pray that you would learn to live in the kingdom principles of the power of strategic obedience as a Christian. 
it really does matter that your obedience starts as a seed. And disobedience has an outcome. But I want to help you to be strategically obedient in your generosity. I want to have the capacity to be strategically obedient in your generosity. Let me show you in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now, I want you to understand a little context for this, this, what I'm about to read to you. The church at Philippi is the first church that was started on that missionary journey, on the second journey, when he went into the province of Macedonia. That area was terribly poor. So much so that the, the, the scripture I read to you about the offering before, the Macedonian Christians who included those at Philippi begged, listen to me, they begged Paul for the privilege of helping the saints in Jerusalem. And Paul said out of their deep poverty, they desired to give. They were kingdom builders. I'm going to read you something that's written to kingdom builders. If this were today, this would be a kingdom builders message. And then the last verse I'm going to read you is not written to every Christian, but to kingdom building Christians. Listen, please. Philippians 4.15 says this. As you know, you Philippians, you were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you or I want money from you. Rather, I desire eternal fruit that is abounding to your account. That's eternally. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the financial gifts you sent with Epaphrodites. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. A kingdom-building offering is an offering to God. And the scripture says, as in the Old Testament, is an offering that has a sweet aroma to the God of the universe because you are partnering with him. And then in verse 9, he gives the promise to the kingdom builder. And while God's word is true for everybody, it doesn't apply always to everybody. This scripture is available to everybody, but, but he's saying this to kingdom builders. Verse 19 of Philippians 4, very oft quoted scripture that I've, I desire that it applies for you and for me. But my God shall supply all your need, kingdom builder. Those who have been generous to the Mas from Macedonia into Thessalonica, into Ephesus, and again and again you've helped me. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. One of the most incredible things to understand of this verse it's not just who it applies to, but the word according. God said, kingdom builder, those of you in Philippi that were in great distress, let me tell you, but the God that you serve, that you serve with your seed, but my God is, listen, he will meet all your need. He shall supply all your need according to something. He gave him now, the, what will that according be? The economy in Macedonia and Philippi, no. If you live in America, according to the efficiency of those in government. Okay, I'll go with this chart of the church. <laughs> Let's borrow 60 trillion bazillion dollars and that won't affect inf inflation. We're brilliant. One plus one doesn't equal five, five billion. It, it's, cra it's crazy. It's hard to fix that kind of crazy. He said, I'm not going to meet your need according to inflation, according to the economy, according to the wisdom or lack thereof of governmental officials. I will meet your needs, listen now, according to my riches. You're my partner. Can I tell you who's not worried about the economy today and their personal needs? Elon Musk. And neither are his partners. Well, I should have more faith in a human being that may or may not know God that will live and die than the God that said, you partner with me. I will meet your needs. According to my riches, and he got some. In glory in Christ Jesus. That's the promise of the kingdom builder. It's my heart's desire that every one of us learn to lean into this kind of intimacy with God. At all of our campuses, with every head bowed and eye closed, before we even go near the impact offering, I want to make certain that everybody has had the opportunity to give their life to Christ. At all of our campuses, and for those of you watching online, with every head bowed and eye closed, if you've never given your life to Christ, that is, if you drew your final breath today, you don't know where you'd spend your eternity. Jesus died for you. He gave his life for you. All of us carry the debt burden of our sin. 
And none of us can pay that debt. And God is righteous and holy and he judged me guilty and he judged you guilty because he's holy. But his mercy, the Bible said, boasted against his judgment. And God so loved you that he gave his son that whoever, listen, whoever would believe in him would not perish because of their sin but could have eternal life. And then Jesus said these amazing words. For the Father did not send his son in the world to condemn it but that through him the world might have life. Jesus, when he hung on that cross, God robed in human flesh, never tasting sin. God judged me guilty and then he poured his wrath and punishment on himself in my place. And the wrath of God fell to Jesus, the Son of God, in my place. And then he died in my place and he was buried in your place. And he rose from the dead, conquering death and offers you eternal life. But you have to choose to receive or reject him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God at all of our campuses, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In a moment, I'm going to ask you, if you desire to receive Christ into your heart, I want to pray for you right, right where you're seated. And we'll all pray a prayer out loud together with you. But in a moment, I'll ask you, say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I'll ask you to acknowledge it through an uplifted hand. If you're online, you can put it in the comments. I'm praying with Pastor John. With every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses, If you've never received Christ or you're not sure and you want to know that you have the free gift of eternal life and you want to receive Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life, with heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just lift your hand real high right where you're seated at all of our campuses and we'll pray for you. Do it right now. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. If you prayed that prayer or you should have, I should say, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this prayer out loud with all of us together. It's not some dead religious prayer, but Jesus, the living Son of God, will come into your life, make you brand new. Your sin debt will be canceled. And when you die, you'll be heaven bound because of a Savior. Pray it out loud where you hear it at all of our campuses as we pray it together with you. Pray where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart and life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin debt is canceled. And when I die, I am heaven bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. And all of our campuses, would you give them a hand? Before we receive our impact offering, at all of our campuses, I want you to watch this video of Zach. He's one of our residents, and his story is remarkable. It actually mirrors, when I listen to it, very similar to what happened to me. He's one of the young men and young women that you're investing in as a seed. Just a few minutes, I want you to hear his story and see the great privilege you have as a kingdom builder to investing in those residents and specifically Zach as a part of our church. Take a look at this at all of our campuses. All my life, music has played a huge role. Even as a young kid, I can remember going to family holiday parties and other get-togethers. And by the end of the night, uh, guitars would always be brought out. And as one big family, we would just sit in the family room uh, playing and singing songs. So last few years of high school, uh, I picked up a guitar for the first time and just started to play around with it. And I really just felt something special when I started to play. Moving into college, I met a girl, and this girl invited me to come to a conference with her down in Atlanta. And that's actually where I had my first real encounter with Jesus Christ. And coming home from that conference, we were both on fire for God. Um, We actually started to date. I started serving uh, at her home church at the time. And one of the areas I started serving was with the worship team. And it was then where I really had a, my first calling, if you will, towards worship. So I continued to serve. Our relationship was also steadily growing. And in 2016, we decided to get married. And life as I knew it was really good until it wasn't. It was about the fall of 2018. 
um, where just over time problems had arisen and we really hadn't dealt with them in a healthy way. And uh, she decided that she no longer wanted to be together. I just remember feeling extremely lonely. I felt like I lost my identity as a person. So on my last weekend at my previous church, it was very emotional. It was very hard for me um, to serve with them the last time, but I knew it was my time to go. And the very next weekend, I came to Victory Family Church. And during this time, uh, I chose to take a break from worship. I knew there were things God needed to deal with me on personally and just to grow me spiritually. So about a year went by, and in February 2020, I decided to step out and audition for the Sozo worship team, and I was accepted in, into that family. And I started to just really sense in my heart that worship was a calling that God had on my life. It was something I was very passionate about. It was something I, I saw myself doing. And I remember distinctly Pastor John giving a message and talking about taking a faith risk. And for three weeks, I meditated on that, taking a faith risk. And it was actually in January of this year where I decided to apply for the residency program for worship. Being a part of the residency has immediately been both rewarding and challenging. And I love being a part of this family. I love serving with this family. And three years ago, I never would have thought any of this was possible. And to see God's faithfulness, God's redemption in my life, I am living proof of God's grace and God's redemption. Uh, someone like me, uh, where I was at the lowest point in my life to be brought to where I am now is simply the unconditional love of God. And I'm so thankful for Victory Family Church and Kingdom Builders because it's you guys who made this possible for someone like me. And I'm just eternally grateful. What a pleasure, man. What a gift, what a gift, what a gift. I want to give you the opportunity now as we give into the impact offering. And you should have all received envelopes when you came in along with the guide, the Kingdom Builders Guide for, for this year. And what I want to ask everyone to do is to participate. And let me explain what I mean by that. Some of you may have brought your gift with you like Michelle and I did today. You can fill out the envelope and drop it in the offering basket as it passes. Now, normally, uh, this is the only time of the year that we pass an offering bucket. We normally just give as you go. But today it's a special time. And we want to celebrate your commitment of generosity into kingdom builders. And this isn't a fundraiser. This is an act of worship before God. It's a partnership with God. And it's my prayer that you see your act of obedience as a seed that will produce for you and for eternity, for you and for others. So you may be a person that brought your gift with you today. You simply put it in the envelope, fill it out, and put it in the offering basket. Perhaps you're a person that gives online or you text to give, and the way to text to give, if you're watching online, is there as well. All you have to do, you don't have to write your name on the envelope, just write text or online. And yet you may be here today and maybe you're, you're not prepared to, to give toward the Kingdom Builders offering, uh, today the impact offering. Now we're gonna be, throughout the year, to the last day this year, we'll be receiving your gifts toward Kingdom Builders as we believe God to reach and exceed the goal of $2.5 million. As each of us don't do the math, but come on, do your part. That's all just what God leads you to do. And for some of you, you might just be a guest today, or you're, maybe you're just like, well, I don't really get all that. And, but I, I just didn't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, so you just drop it in there as well. Whether you're just going to do it later and just you're not prepared, or maybe you're just, just a guest and you're like, gosh, I'm just visiting. We don't expect you as a guest to do anything. But that way everybody can just drop it in. I don't want anyone to feel awkward about anything, but I want every one of us to have the opportunity. I want to pray over your gift and over your obedience. And as you're receiving the offering, you're going to see a video of people from around the world thanking you for your kingdom building giving. Then our worship team is going to lead us into one song. When they, when they do, just stand with them and let's worship God through one song and we'll be on our way. But let's celebrate the privilege of being kingdom builders. Let me pray over your lives and over this impact offering. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege today to give into the kingdom of God as we partner together with you Lord, I over your people today, here online, wherever they be, when, when or where they're watching this, that they would see their obedience strategic and as a seed, and that the consequence, Lord, as they look and we look to the rich young ruler and we say, how, how could he have done that? How could he have said no to Jesus? 
Lord, help us to understand that we get that choice right now and we're no different than he. We just have the privilege of knowing his story. Help us to understand that we are called to be kingdom builders and that our giving and our obedience is strategic and it will multiply the kingdom of God. I pray the blessing of heaven upon them that as they sow, so shall they reap that you will abundantly provide for them, not to be a reservoir, but to be a river where resources of heaven pass in them, to them, and through them to affect the lives of others for time and for eternity. So, Father, I thank you for the great privilege of being kingdom builders. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of bringing the gospel to the earth. And I speak life over every one of them. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen, amen. Worship God as you give. Well, hey church, my name is Josh Pay, and I have the joy of serving with World Vision, a global Christian humanitarian organization that is serving in more than 100 different countries around the world, boldly witnessing to the message of Jesus Christ while bringing tangible resources to communities living on less than $1.90 a day. And I know this is a big weekend for the church, and we just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to Kingdom Builders, but thank you to you for being so generous and allowing the goodness of God to flow through you. You know, we run the National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's a hotline that takes calls from all around the country 24 seven. And this week alone, we have seen two new rescues, one adult and one minor female. And you know what, there's no better feeling than knowing that what we're doing is impacting real lives, real futures. We couldn't do that without you and without your generosity. This is Peter Ward from Urban Impact on the north side of Pittsburgh. We want to thank Kingdom Builders and Victory Family Church for your just generous, grateful giving to our ministry. It is through partnerships like yours that I am now able to become a second year intern through Crew at Slipper Rock University. And it is my pleasure to be able to mentor women on this campus as well as coach our student leaders here and evangelize the students and faculty. Through our joint efforts, we have expanded God's kingdom in over 165 nations, and your giving, combined with an army of volunteers and workers, have cascaded in a face-to-face sharing of the gospel with over 116 million people. You've had a big part in helping to build a second House of Palms campus that will house 100 more children. These young girls and boys have been caught in a 500-year cycle of prostitution, but now we're seeing their lives redeemed. Thank you also for giving to support the 86 children in our first campus where they're being cared for, discipled, and educated for a bright future. We are so thankful for your passion. Your giving here goes to Rayma Zambia, a two-year Bible school where close to a thousand people have graduated from in the last 10 years. In 10 days, the head of the National Public Health Program of Zambia is graduating. So it is not an, an overstatement to say you are touching a nation. Your giving enables us to serve 21 missionary families serving in 15 nations around the world. You assist us with projects with people groups that before the church has never targeted. We are seeing Muslim groups have historic conversions. Only in heaven will we know the full impact of your giving. Victory Family Church, Pastors John and Michelle, man, we are so thankful for you guys at One Hope. This year, you've helped us to reach over 60,000 kids in Asia going door to door with the gospel. And also, you've helped us to reach over 15,000 people in Ukraine, making sure that they have their needs met, but also the Word of God during this time of crisis. So Kingdom Builders, thank you for all that you do. In these last two crusades, we saw thousands and thousands of people give their lives to Jesus. In every service, we saw lame people walk, blind eyes see, deaf ears open. We want to thank you so much for being a part of building God's kingdom all the way here in Africa. And our heart is to raise up the next generation of leaders. And that's through the campuses. Our heart is for campus ministry. We just want to thank every kingdom builder for being a part of what God is doing all the way here in Kampala, Uganda. You have helped us to train Asian nationals to plant churches in unreached villages, to bring help and aid to the needy, and to impact Asian children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you, thank you for the eternal difference you're making here and also all around the world. 